And welcome back to the Financially Simple Experience. So friends, we're going to have part two, part two of our discussion around firing yourself as the lead producer within your business. In our last episode, we spent a lot of time talking about why it's important that you as the owner, you as the CEO, you as the president, you as the chief shareholder, you as the founder of your company, whoever you are in your title, that you seeking an eight-figure exit cannot be or should not be the lead producer, the top producer, the best salesperson within your organization. In our last episode, if you'll remember, we introduced the idea that that letting go, you know, we had worked so long and so hard within our own industries to earn the respect of our potential clients that now we're almost there's some pride in the fact that we can close bigger cases or cases that, that require more sophistication or more knowledge than 15, 20, 30 years ago when we first began in our businesses. But yet, if we do not let go of this top sales position that we find ourselves in, oftentimes as a founder, as a CEO, as a business owner, then we can't move on to the important discussion around decentralization. And we spent some time last episode talking about how decentralization leads us to this eight-figure exit that we're all aspiring to have within our own companies. In order for us to decentralize, we have to often fire ourselves as a chief producer. In our last episode, we talked about how we should be exceeding industry standards. And I spent a significant amount of time looking at the standards or the measurements that the financial advisory business might have in play. Now, like I've been mentioning for several of the last episodes, as we're dealing specifically with financial advisory practices, you may not be a financial advisor. You you may be a a blue collar business owner. You may own an HVAC company or a diesel mechanic like I spoke with yesterday. You may own some other type of a business that's not necessarily that of a financial advisory practice. So I'm building these episodes to where the content is directly applicable to any business owner. So you have your own industry standards, whatever they may be for your particular NAIC code or your particular SIC code. Whatever your business is, there are some standards that you should be able to ascertain and you could put those within your target or within your, your, your crosshairs to aim your business toward as you grow and move forward to your potential exit. We concluded last episode with some key questions, some th- key data points that you just have to know as the business owner. If you remember, we asked the question, how many clients do you have today as a company? What's your average revenue per client? What's your average client retention rate? How many leads are you receiving per month? What is the source of these leads? What's your close rate? How many hours are are you dedicating to prospecting each month? And what is your cost of acquisition? Those were some key foundational questions that I I left you with as homework for last time. And hopefully you went back, you looked in your business, you were able to ascertain what these particular current data points are. So now let's go to part two. How do you prepare your department, your sales department, to close more leads and spur organic growth without losing the momentum and the efficiency that you've worked perhaps decades to build? That's the key question. How can we transfer this position of chief salesperson, top producer within our own businesses to the next generation, to a protege, to a colleague, to a mentee that's beside us? How do we do this without, without losing momentum and efficiency, and allowing the company to close more leads and spur organic growth. So today's episode, we're going to answer that question by diving into four specific areas, sales tracking, lead analysis, creating a defined process, and improving prospecting data. So let's dive into it. First area we're going to focus on is sales tracking, sales tracking. Before we go any further, we got to understand what is sales tracking? It's the process of collecting essential sales matrix, analyzing them, and using the data to improve your sales process. If you do it correctly, sales tracking is going to provide you with deep insights into each stage of the sales process or the cycle that your company undertakes and help you reach your goal. So sales tracking is simply what are we doing, what are the results, and how can we modify it? Now, according to Investment News in a recent article they had, they they illustrated that many financial advisory firms are consistently under-investing in the organic growth efforts of the firm. They're spending an average of 1.2 to 1.9% of revenues on marketing or organic growth. Now, that's a shocking number to me because I've always spent significantly greater than that. 
in my own companies. And in fact, when we advise business owners, we typically lean a little bit more aggressive than the SBA does. The Small Business Association says, hey, you might consider four to six percent, depending on which article you might read from them. I'm of the opinion that you should be north of about 10% in total revenue if you want to hyperly grow your company. If you have the systems built and you're now trying to supercharge the growth of your company, oftentimes if the systems are built, that's the key of what I said there. If the systems are built, then typically by deploying the cash into the systems, you can break other areas of the company that allow the company to grow and allow the company to flex and bend and build more value. But it's interesting to me that we financial advisors spend such a dismal amount of our total revenue on organic growth efforts. We just do not deal with that. Therefore, if we're not allocating the dollars properly to our to our sales funnel, the top of the funnel is not being filled with the right prospects. Our brand is suffering. We're not demonstrating credibility to our potential clients. And it's harder for us to attract the number of clients that we need in order for us to build a sales department that drives us to the eight-figure exit. Therefore, it's imperative that we have a system in place that tracks how many leads are generated each week, each month, each year, where they're coming from, and what our close rate is. What our close rate is. See, if you have that data, you can make decisions based on facts, not opinions or beliefs or feelings. Man, I got to tell you, so many times I I sit down with a business owner, and ask them a question, and they say, well, I feel this way, or I think this way, and I'm like, well, what's the data show? And they don't know the data. And so wonder we feel like we're wasting dollars in marketing because we never built the systems, and therefore we don't deploy the dollars, and it's almost like this reverse vortex that allows our businesses to almost live on this life support model. No wonder we have a hard time reaching an eight-figure exit. There's a report. That was done by Spotio, which is a sales automation firm that shows that 80% of sales require five follow-ups. Think about this. You meet a prospective client. You meet them one time. They're interested in what you do. You give, you give them your elevator pitch. Maybe they talk to your email you a week later and you email them. And then more than likely, we quit. In fact, 44% of, of people selling a product or a service give up just after one contact. But yet 80% of people require up to five contacts before they engage the business. So if you don't have a sales process and you're trying to operate by the seat of your pants, you're operating from the yellow pad or from your memory, or even relying upon just the flow from your centers of influences, you're not going to receive the flow of new prospects to shift yourself out of the lead producer seat. So you need a system. Not only does the sales system allow you to make decisions based on real data, but it also allows you to identify symptoms of the process before they become critical problems. I was literally talking with a client yesterday. He sent me an urgent request. It's a long-term client of mine, somebody who I deeply care for. He said, just an urgent meeting request, an ASAP. Well, I had a pretty full day, and I said, man, I got 30 minutes here between these two events. So we hopped on the phone. He had sent me a a long email explaining the urgency and what he wanted to pick my brain on. And when I got down through all, I'm literally almost five pages of data, which was very helpful for me and my analytical mind. And we got down through all the facts. It came down to he didn't have a system in place for this particular problem. It was a sales problem. He didn't have a system in place. And because he didn't have a system, he wasn't able to identify the symptoms of the sales process. And it created a monumental problem for this individual. It, the bookkeeper didn't see it. The operations team didn't see it. Ended up having to refund a mid six figure overcharge because the sales process was flawed. And so, had he identified the sales process and had it in writing and built the process, he could have seen the symptoms and solved this problem before it became a critical problem for his business. So, friends, I'm telling you, the sales process is vital. Not only does it allow you to see the symptoms, but it allows you to see the strengths and weaknesses of your team. You see, you yourself know your product. You know your service. You can you can just get into a meeting and you can just off the cusp talk about the history of the firm, where you're going, the passion just extrudes from your voice as it does with all of us who are passionate about what we do. But a salesperson who you've hired in and maybe doesn't have the tenure, the history, the understanding of the bigger business, they may not have as much passion. They may not have the, the same capabilities. So a sales process allows you to see the strengths and weaknesses of your team 
and allows you to help them be successful. Because remember, if they're successful, you're successful. It allows you to test new ideas and methods. I'm reminded of, of many of these crowdfunding type platforms where you come up with an idea, you put it out on a, on a crowdfunding type platform. If a lot of people think it's going to be a good, a good type of an investment, an idea, a product, a widget, then they may deploy some cash to that particular idea. It's the same concept when it comes to building a sales process for your financial advisory firm. If you're thinking about introducing a new concept, a new portfolio, a new strategy, a new, a new law changes, and you want to implement it with your business, your sales process allows you to quickly test your new ideas with your core group of clients, your core group of prospects, or whomever the idea is applicable to. So friends, a sales process is paramount. Finally, the sales process allows you to customize your sales approach to meet your client's needs. It's been said that many times we lose revenue because we're not focusing the product to our current clients. It's often easier to enhance or drive value to your current clients, which rewards you with compensation, more so than it is to go out and attract a new client. See, a sales process allows you to look through so many different areas. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the need for the sales process. We've got that. But what are we going to track in the process? You know, there's many ways you can track or you can look work through a sales process. Many people look at a performance-based tracking. In other words, it shows you if your team is making strides, attracting new clients. You look at a number of varied types of metrics, such as the number of cold calls they're making, the number of scheduled meetings, emails that are inbound, emails being sent outbound, uh, messages coming through your website. So you can do a performance-based tracking. Another tracking you could do is sales lead tracking. That's where you're going to track various metrics that allows you to rank your most valuable leads on your list and see how many of your most valuable leads close. Sales lead tracking. Another one you can do is sales goal tracking. Now, I'm a goal-oriented type person, so for me, a goal makes sense. In fact, this is the same concept that I used in my own practice. A sales goal is, is putting a number out there. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a number of clients that you want to acquire within a particular time frame. Maybe it's a dollar figure that you want to acquire. But it's a sales goal tracking mechanism. To me, this makes the most sense for my style of business. But you may not have the same personality or the things that drive me may not drive you. But it's a way that you can track. In fact, I was, I was digging into the, uh, the goal track. I came across an interesting quote by Amy Pavlove, the founder and CEO of Select Advisors Institute. And she said a very powerful statement. I want you to hear the statement. She says, sales involve quality and quantity. You must be a quality person and communicate well. But you also have to take your chances playing a numbers game where the prospects is allowed to say no. But the odds are radically in favor of a good advisor in a world short of them. If they, the advisor, see a quota as the key to achieving sales and growth. See, if you're going to use a sales goal tracking, a good advisor will see this quota, this goal as an ability for them to reach their success. So you can put a goal, a sales goal out there, and it can also couple with the, the sales team compensation package. Another method, method that you could track is called sales funnel tracking. Sales funnel tracking. There are many businesses that we actually track this more so than a goal. So you might track things like the number of inbound leads, the number of qualified leads per month, your total conversion rate. Now, as I began in my own practice, growing toward my eight-figure exit, I began with a sales goal and then quickly implemented these other three areas. And so I began tracking multiple things because I realized that in order for me to improve, I had to measure. For me to measure, I had to track. And for me to track, I had to teach. So I began building these systems, teaching and then tracking and then measuring and improving and quickly drove the company to the eight-figure exit that, that I desired. So we understand now that we had to track the sales, sales tracking. I want to dive into the second thing that we can implement, and that is called lead analysis. What is lead analysis? According to one particular source, it is the art of analyzing your sales and marketing leads. Why? To learn more about which of your conversion strategies are likely to have the biggest impact on, get this, 
your bottom line. So lead analysis is all about NOI, net operating income, or profits, margin, whatever term you want to use for your particular business. See, if you're not analyzing the clients coming through your sales funnel, then how do you know that you're having a direct impact to the eight-figure exit? Again, the art of analyzing your sales and marketing leads to learn more about which of your conversion strategies, which strategy is giving the greatest impact on your bottom line. So lead analysis simply is trying to do that. So how do we analyze the leads? There's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can look at a visit to lead conversion rate. This is one of those metrics that you can look at that'll help you determine if it's if your marketing is profitable. So what is a visit to lead conversion rates? How many people are actually visiting your website? And then out of those individuals, how many of them are interacting with you on the content? And then out of those interacting, how many of those are reaching out to you for service? And of those reaching out to you for service, how many of them do you actually close? So you've got a visit, which is your big number. You have to delineate that down to how many actually close within a month. So let's say hypothetically that you had one new client off of your, your process. Let's just call it a website. That's, that's for this example. You could use social media. You could use internal mailings. You could use a paid advertising. You can use TV, radio, podcasts, whatever venue you want to use. How many people are looking at it and how many leads did you get? So let's say you got you closed one new client that came off of your website, and of your website you had 10,000 views. You simply divide one by 10,000, and it gives you your lead conversion rate. Another measurement you can look at is your overall contact growth. How many people are you communicating today with, and then how many people are you communicating next month with? So one of the easiest ways to look at this is let's say you have an email newsletter. And on your email newsletter, you have 2,000 subscribers who are actively engaged in your email newsletter this month. And the next month, you have 2,200. Well, you had a 10% increase. That's another way that you can measure your particular lead funnel or your lead analysis. Another measurement is the engagement rates. The engagement rates within your current marketing campaign will help you determine exactly which marketing strategies are pushing your ideal clients to action. See, many times we push a lot of data out. We, we market a lot. We send postcards. We buy billboards. We get on radio. We use social media. We use websites. We use video. We use a number of different things. But which one, which one has the engagement tenor? Which one has the engagement velocity that's pushing the exact client we desire to work with to action? Which of them are generating the leads for people who reach out and say, hey, I need help? For various type of practices, it's going to be a different venue. What works for me and my practice and my personality may not work for you and your practice and your personality. But nonetheless, we can track our engagement rates. We need to know this for our lead analysis. And then finally, we could look at our client close rate. How often are your leads converting to genuine customers? I would take it a step further. How often are your leads converting to genuine customers that are at or above your average customer value. You see, we, we could go out and bring in a bunch of customers that would delineate or dilute our average customer value. But what we're really trying to do to an eight-figure exit is we want to move our average customer value north. We want to move it up. So if you're looking at your client closure rate, how many customers per month are you converting from the leads, what's the ratio, into the ideal customer that's driving your customer value up? Now, why is all this important? Because lead analysis, lead analytics enables you, the business owner, to focus on the prospects which are most likely to pay attention to your marketing. Likewise, it allows you to then train your sales team, your replacement team, on how to communicate with those ideal prospects how to communicate with the personas of your ideal prospects and ultimately helps you identify the efficiencies for your sales and marketing team. Friends, lead analysis is paramount. I'm often shocked with business owners don't have a data points on how many leads they get, how many leads convert, what type of leads are converting, are they the right leads, et cetera, which is why I gave you the homework out of last episode. So if we're trying to build a best-in-class sales department and we're trying to decentralize ourselves from that sales department, one of the first things we do is have to set, track our sales process. 
We have to know the process and we have to know where each client or prospect is within that process. Number one. Number two, we have to understand the leads that are coming into our door. We have to analyze those and make sure that they're the right, the right type of lead to help us meet our long-term goals. And then number three, we have to create a uniform process, document and refine. Look, I talk about processes often because processes allow for scale. Processes allow for increased margin. Processes allow for decentralization. Processes are there to help remove human error. Processes are paramount. And if you're going to drive your company to an eight-figure exit, you have to have the processes created. If you're going to fire yourself as the chief producer of your business, then you have to have the processes which are going to give you reasonable results or the results you desire from the sales team that you'll implement. I can remember again, whenever I began this whole process in my own company, walking my, my new sales director, whatever term you want to call him there, or his job description, I can't remember, it eludes me at this particular point, Years ago, he's sitting beside me on the floor of my office. I'm talking with this major lead that comes in, and then I give it to this individual, and he walks it through. And he walks it through the sales process that our team had helped me ascertain. So we literally spent weeks of them listening to me in the sales process, putting step by step by step, writing out templates for communication with the clients, building scripts on what to say, what not to say, talking about how to... Uh, What are the key topics? What are the key pain points for these individuals? We spent weeks, months building these things out. And then my colleague was able to jump right into that process, follow all the steps and land at that time, the largest client of our company. I got to tell you, whenever that transpired, it was like a major affirmation to our entire company. It wasn't Justin. It wasn't me. It wasn't for, it wasn't the salesperson who did it. It was an affirmation to planning a process in detail from start to finish through a collaborative effort and then watching the process work. Now, as he began working through this process going forward, we noticed that there were some inefficiencies. We refined some of the things that worked well for me that wasn't working well for others in the company. But the third thing you're going to do if you're going to fire yourself is you've got to create a detailed process. You've got to document. You've got to be ready to refine it. So as of today, we've we've talked about why sales tracking is important. We've talked now about let's analyze our leads. And now we talked about the detail of a sales process. And we've done videos, podcasts on how to actually create the sales process. So I'm not going to dive that much deeper into that talking point there. However, I do want to dive a little deeper into the fourth point. And that is how do you improve prospect data? How do you improve your prospects quality? You see, many times when we've, whenever we start handing off leads to a sales protege or to a colleague, the quality may wane. The quality may fall in nature because that particular salesperson doesn't have the same history, the same swagger, the same you know passion perhaps that you have. So go back to the point of today's episode. How can you prepare your sales department to close more leads spur more organic growth without losing momentum or efficiency. And friends, it's going to all, after you you set your sales tracking, after you talk about your leads and you build your process, it's going to come down to this point that we're on now, and that is improving the prospect data. So what is prospect data? In its most basic form is the contact information, email, phone number, first name, last name, company, et cetera, whatever it is that you may need, that your organization has on hand for its sales and marketing leads. See, the more data that you can gain on the front side of a conversation, the more likely you are to provide a sales team for success. Many of us have CRM or customer relationship management software programs within our businesses, over the years, I've seen the CRM systems of the financial world ebb and flow. They, they were very anemic in the infancy, and now they're very robust. But in order to become hyper-efficient in creating a sales department, the data that enters in your CRM must be paramount. So part of the sales process is a give and take of collecting the data that your sales team needs in order to help meet the client's expectations, in order to help communicate how your offering can, can enhance the prospective client's demands, their needs, their goals, how you can drive them toward their goals. 
There was a 2022 state of the CRM data management study, which illustrated two very important data points that we need to know. The first data point said that 44% of businesses say they lose more than 10% in annual revenue due to poor quality prospect data. In other words, they get the basic information they need in order to hopefully make the sales pitch, but they don't have the the, the meat. They just have the basic outline of the bone. My, my dad used to say, son, if you're eating a chicken leg, you got to eat the meat, spit out the bone. Chicken wings are the same way. They, many of CRMs, we're anemic in what we collect from our clients. And the least bit of pushback that we get, we back up and then we go and make our sales pitch like every other financial firm or every other business owner within your space. We've got to improve our prospect data. Out of the study, another key point came out. It also stated that 75% of the respondents of the study said that they often or sometimes fabricate data to tell the story they want the decision maker to hear. <laughs> In fact, 33% often said they often did it and 42% said they sometimes did it. So 75% of the people out there said they make up stuff to, in order to sell a decision maker on what they want to hear. <laughs> Friends, that doesn't work, especially in the financial place. If we can build the prospecting data to where we get what we need, then we can drive our team to success. The study concluded with one fact, and it said that 96% of respondents said that accurate data improved their conversion rates. So as we're looking at this particular point of improving our prospect data, this is the data that the people that we want to engage with are giving us before we ever begin our sales call. The more information we can get and the more accurate information we can get, the more success that we have in closing the case. But more importantly, we're in the business as financial advisors of helping people achieve their goals, their dreams. They come into our offices and they pour their lives out for us. The more data we have up front, the more likely we are to help the client achieve their goals. It's a win-win for everybody. The very fact that we may not have the best data, the most full, complete data, or the accurate data leads us to conclude that many times we have bad data within our system. So one of the things we can improve upon is removing the bad data from our process. So for example, you could develop an email verification system. So in other words, you're asking the client to give you their name, email address, phone number. They enter that in, boom, it sends you, they hit enter or go or submit or whatever it is on your form. And immediately there's an email that comes from your team back to the client that says, hey, we received this form. Please verify by clicking this button to verify the information above. So you're basically just getting an email verification to make sure that the email went through and didn't bounce back. That helps you verify that the email is accurate. See, Verifying the data is not hard. We have systems that can do it, but many of us don't think this way. Another thing we can do is we can purge the bad data. You know, oftentimes we get bounced emails. This number should be relatively low, less than 2% within our whole CRM system. Many times we're, we're working with business owners, we're working with financial advisors of which who have hired us to help them engage and drive the value of their companies forward and have start looking at the bounce rates and they're in the 15, 20, 30% range, which means the data within the CRM system, the data in which the sales team is using is not good, it's dirty. And if the email is incorrect, then many times the various other things inside the data is incorrect, like their favorite food, their favorite sports team, what caused them to reach out to you to begin with. See, by having incorrect data, it's going to damage your firm's reputation, your sales team's reputation during the sales process. Another strategy that you might consider employing in your business to improve your prospect data is to have an email sunset policy, an email sunset policy. HubSpot is a pretty popular CRM management system, uh, email management system um, that's out in the marketplace. I've used it personally. HubSpot says that email sunset policy is, and I quote, a plan of action for how to manage disengaged contacts that are no longer opening your marketing and sales emails. So let's paint the picture. In your business, you have 2,000, 10,000, 100,000, it doesn't matter. You have a ton of contacts via emails. You got a lot of people's email addresses. And you send out a regular newsletter in this example. You send out a regular newsletter and you get a significant bounce back. 
Okay, that means we have bad emails. Next thing is you send out an, an email and you have roughly a 30% open rate or 10% open rate or whatever the number is for your particular system. And it's significantly below the industry average. What a sunset policy allows you to do is to try to re-engage those individuals who are no longer opening your regular emails. You can, you can do it through a number of different ways. You can engage them through an interesting offer. You can say, hey, last chance to open, moving you from the list. It's a takeaway sale. There's, there's many, many, many different ways to create an email sunset policy. So as I've been talking through this lead analysis point, I've taken the approach in today's conversation of, hey, you've got a website. You've got a website that they're going to, and then they're coming through. And they're filling out an email system. And then you're following your email program to get your sales team in front of this prospect. But friends, the same lead analysis can be performed through all of your funnels, all of your entry points into your business. You may have call to actions in your social media. You may have call to actions in your local media, in your television, radio, billboards, advertising within your school magazines. The idea of lead analysis can be performed through every entry point into your company. So let's review. You're the top salesperson. We talked about that last episode. You've now done some homework and you know the current data as it relates to your business. You know how many customers you have. You know what the average customer value is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now you've got to begin a process of removing yourself, firing yourself as the top producer within your company. In order to do that, you have to identify four things. You have to track your sales. You have to have sales tracking throughout the entire process. Where are the customers? Where are they falling off? Where are you making strides, winning, et cetera? You have to analyze the leads. The leads coming through, are they the right leads to help you increase your customer value? Are they the right leads that you will help you drive you to the eight-figure exit? You have to clearly define the process. So as you clearly define the process, you are able, enabled to look at the sales track. You're enabled to and analyze the leads. And then you've also got to improve your prospect data. The more data that you can get from your prospects through a give-and-take relationship the more success your sales team will have in converting prospects and replacing you. The goal is to replace you as a top salesperson. Friends, this is a lot of information, and this is a hard one because many of us, especially those of us in the financial advisory space, we have scratched and clawed and scrimped and saved to earn the respect of our communities, of our prospects, of our clients, to reach a certain point to where now I'm saying, hey, you're now starting to get the biggest customers of your life coming and ask for help, and you're going to turn those over to a protege or to a colleague. That's hard. But if you're going to achieve the eight-figure exit, you have to have a sales process. In addition to achieve the eight-figure exit, we have to fire ourselves as a top salesperson. The buyer, the buyer does not want the risk of buying the business from us for premium dollars, and then within a year, 18 months, as we exit that the float or that the flow coming in, new customers coming in as it was projecting ceases. It will harm you in terms of the purchase price if you remain as a key salesperson or you're going to see some, some provisions of earnouts and clawbacks that may not be as advantageous as it could be. So friends, now's the time. If you see an exit coming in the next five to 10 years, let's start the sales process. Let's start moving yourself and firing yourself as a top producer within your company. If this makes sense, you need help, reach out to us. If this makes sense, hey, reach out on social media and shoot me an attaboy. I always like to hear from our listeners on, on what is inspiring them and what's helping them. Until next time, friends, y'all go out and make it a great day.